So we have parables today. Now, the word para in Greek means beside. And the word balian, which is the last part of parable, means to throw. So it's to throw beside. And so we are throwing beside the parable of what the kingdom of God is to what the world is. And they're two different things. Because the kingdom of God is something we aspire to and the world is what we're living in. And so anytime in the Bible you see a parable or hear of a parable or it says, and Jesus told them a parable, he is putting up an absolute of what it would be like if he was living, if we could live in the world Jesus lived in. And he's putting beside it what it's like to live in the world that we live in. Now, there's questions about if we keep the kingdom of God there, because kingdom, I don't know about you, but it makes me think of this little magical Disney castle and this horses or knights riding up to it and, and that. And so it, it brings it down to earth. And so maybe the reign of God is better because we want something that is, is not a concrete thing, but something for us to aspire to. So what we're going to talk to today, today is about a parable that is comparing what the reign of God would be like, the ultimate would be, to where we are now. And so what they've done in this readings is they've taken the cedar tree from the first lesson and put it with the mustard seed or tree or bush in the gospel. So who here has a cedar closet in their house or a cedar chest or anything cedar? Yeah. And why do you use the cedar? Keep the bugs out. Yeah. Any other reasons? Anybody like the smell? Yeah. Cedar has a whole lot of, of applications to it. It can be used as a uh, the oil of it can be used, and the good thing about cedar is that when it grows, it grows straight and tall. And so the best cedar forests in all of the world are in Lebanon, which is where the Old Testament scripture is in Tyre and in Sidon. And so in Lebanon, they had these huge cedar forests that were there back in way before Christ was. And in my American mind, I kind of picture what I've seen around uh, Mount Tamalpais in North Carolina, I mean in uh, North, Northern California. If anybody has been to the great redwood trees there that are just amazing, you, you stand and you look up and you just almost fall all the way back because they just keep going and going and going. And so the cedar trees do this. I have not been to Lebanon, so I have not been able to see what part of that forest is left. But the thing about cedar trees is that they, go, they grow straight. So they're really good for like masks of sailboats and ships and stuff like that. And they were really good. They were used in Solomon's uh, castle and they were used in the temple. There was an, in the first temple, there was an entire room that was made of cedar. You can just imagine walking into it, what it would feel like. No bugs in there. And so cedar was used and these forests in Lebanon were basically, they were just clear cut because everybody wanted the cedar and so they would send slaves over to get the cedar and then they would take them to the river and they would float them down the river and then when they got to the land they would have the slaves put them on the ships bring them down to wherever they were going to bring them and then get the slaves to download them again and take them and then to put them up lots of slave labor and we will talk about that a little bit later too so cedar if you had cedar, it automatically said wealth. It automatically told people, oh, these people have really nice things. Um, it, it just kind of exuded it. And when you would take that smell and smell that fresh cedar and everything, it just, the smell went with, this is the elite. This is, it was almost like purple. If you had purple and cedar, you were way up there. All right, so then we go to the mustard seed. Now, the mustard seed, it says in, in the gospel that the mustard seed is the smallest seed. It's not, but at that point in the world, it probably was the smallest one they knew. The thing about the mustard seed is it comes in all kinds of colors. 
It's yellow, it's black, it's brown, it's colors in between, and it's found all over the world. It's not like the cedar trees are just in various places. Mustard grows all over the place. I mean, literally all over the world. And it's not exactly pretty because it, it comes up, but what it does is it's kind of, I don't, it's almost like kudzu. It just kind of goes wherever it wants to go, and it can be ground cloth and, and that kind of thing. And so it's all over the place. And some people look at it and they just think it's ugly. And so when you compare to something that is just everyday run of the mill, you can find it anywhere. And it's, it's down on the, the ground to the cedar, which is tall and elegant. It's like, okay, this must be the kingdom of God, this tall and elegant thing. And these mustard seeds, these weeds, this must be what the world looks like. But we're talking about Jesus, so do you think that's the way it is? No, we know better than that. So, where I want to, when we lived in Texas the first time, I was so excited that down in Galveston was where Juneteenth came from because I was just so thrilled that Galveston had something that they didn't borrow from New Orleans or that they didn't get from Dallas or from some other place. They had their very own celebration, and it was Juneteenth. And Juneteenth itself started out as a prayer service and as a worship service. And it took place two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. It took that long for the word to get down into Texas, Galveston in particular, to say that the slaves were free. And so the slaves were really excited about that. And the first thing they did was they went and they thanked God. They said, thank you for, for this. So I want to go forward a couple of hundred years, and since Lutherans have Martin Luther, there's Martin Luther King Jr., who was a big part of the uh, Freedom March and a big part of that. Did you know that his name originally was Michael? But he changed it. It was Michael Luther, but he changed it to Martin because he wanted to be able to take the reformer's name and to give it some oomph. And so he and Martin Luther both were married to really strong women. They both had children that supported them. And there's, if you compare the two men, there's a whole lot of, of things though that were a lot of like. And I know this because when I teach Martin Luther in confirmation, so many of the kids there think I'm talking about Martin Luther King Jr. And so I have to make sure that they realize they're two separate people and that one was in America and one was over in Germany and over in Europe. So Martin Luther King Jr. made a difference in going out and telling people and setting the stage for what it would look like. He was a great, the I have a dream speech, I can see little children, I can, I can see all of that. So he was the great reformer in, in that way. But today what I wanna talk about and who I wanna talk about is Miss Ruby Bridges. Is she awake? Grace, can I come have you stand up here just a minute? How old are you, Grace? Four. Can you come up here for a minute? Now, Ruby was five, so she was a year older. But I want you to imagine someone as precious of this as this. And now I'm going to ask Randy and I'm going to ask John for you to stand up. And Randy, if you'll stand here. All right, now, Miss Ruby, yes, yeah, we're going to walk between you. Miss Ruby had to walk through men that were this tall. And those of you on the aisle stand up. And all of these people, now I want you to see the size, were saying really mean things to her as she walked. This little bitty girl that was five years old. Really mean things to her. Now, can you imagine saying anything but how precious this child is to this child? What did that feel like to walk through here? Was that pretty cool? Yeah? You know all these people love you completely, don't you? Yeah, I know you do. I know you do. Okay, you can go on back to, to Miss Audrey. I know you were getting snuggles in there. Thank you. Okay, so this little child... Miss Ruby Bridges, five years old, is taken by four huge men into a school in New Orleans, Louisiana. 
Now, the law already said she could go, but she had to take a test to get in, and six little girls passed this test, and so they split them up and put three in one school, three in the other school. The school Ruby went to, the other two stepped out before the first day of school, so Ruby went by herself. The school district kept her out of school until November with all kinds of different reasons she couldn't go. The first day she goes in November, she has people lining up the sides, spitting on her, calling her horrific names, telling her that they were going to poison her food to the point that she quit eating. She would only eat prepackaged things because she was afraid someone was going to get in there to do it. And the worst one I won't even say just because we have young ears here, but it was horrific that what things people did to this small little girl. So when she finally started in November, the only teacher they could get, her, get for her was a teacher whose husband was in the Air Force and had taught all over the world and didn't have a problem teaching a child that had different color. So Ruby had a class, an entire school to herself for most of the year because other parents wouldn't let their children go to that school. I do have to say the first parent that broke that line was a male clergy, so I'm thinking it had to be either Lutheran or Episcopal because Catholics wouldn't be having a child. I was going, yay for that. A child a year older than this precious one. So I bring this up for this Juneteenth celebration because this happened in my lifetime. This happened in most of your lifetimes. This is real. Now, it had been 2,000 years, 2,200 years since the Emancipation Proclamation. But in New Orleans, hop, skip, and a jump from here, this is what was happening in 1960. Now, that's not what God was talking about with this mustard seed and why God's mustard seed has so many different colors to it and why the mustard seed grows the way it grows and why God made the mustard seed. Did you know that the mustard seed in some countries, they fry it and they eat it as a vegetable? What do we do with it? We put water and vinegar with it and put it on our ham sandwiches. But the thing is, this mustard seed, this little bitty teeny tiny thing can be used in different ways for different countries. Others go ahead and make some kind of polis off of it. And if you've got bad arthritis or whatever, you can put it on there and the heat from the mustard will we'll draw out the pain from that. It's called a mustard seed polis. I think that's the word for it. Thank you, poultice. That word. <laughs> the kingdom of God. The reason we need these parables in our life is because we need God to lift up for us what God wants us to do. Because I'll be honest with you, when I'm scared... And when I'm not feeling good, I want my people around me. I know in the past week with my mother dying, I wanted to be able to talk to my husband and my children on a daily basis. That's what we do. When we feel uncomfortable, we want to make our worlds really, really small because when we can't control things, we want to control any and everything we can. That's who we are. But the kingdom of God says we live in a big world. We don't live in a small one. And it says wherever we end up going and whoever we end up being with, that God is there. And that we can trust that. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's tangly and you trip on it. And it has bird's nest in it. And it's used to make arthritis feel better and to make ham sandwiches feel better. And it's used for all kinds of things. And some people call it a weed. 